Hey everyone, welcome again to another episode of Adscast, and I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, Linus, who's joining me live from Italy. Um, thanks for your time today, Linus, I really appreciate it. Um, just so that everyone's aware, uh, Linus um, is a rather distinguished individual with a long list of uh, accomplishments. Uh, despite his relative uh, youth, um, Linus is a rapper, he's a boxer, he's an author, he's a philanthropist, he's a podcaster, uh, he's got a degree in law, so if anyone has a, a spot of bother, he's your man. Um, but also, similarly to myself, um, Linus is somebody who likes to get out there and do things, and he is a little concerned, as am I, that those who are following in our footsteps perhaps don't have the same raw desire and hunger to go out there and grab life by the the horn so to speak and achieve things so uh i wanted to get him on just to talk about a great number of things um then yeah welcome linus really appreciate it yeah it's great to be on thanks thanks for having me no worries um as i said there to everyone um you've recently relocated to italy which is amazing yeah. But also bold, considering that um, COVID hasn't long um, de-escalated from its pandemic state. How come you uh, you moved out there? What was the the draw? Well, first thing you've got to know about me, I think um, that, that that thinking is overrated. Um, when I when I started the process to join uh, the IFA, the Independent Financial Advisory that I work for, it was long. It was arduous. I think I went through about eight interviews um, and then one day I got the job offer. I got the offer for the Milan office. I took about four seconds to think about it and accepted it because, you know, if you if you think too much about things, what, what's going to end up happening is you're going to end up being a pessimist about certain things. And I'm 21, man. What, what's the worst that can happen? I have no responsibilities. I have no family. I have no wife. I have no kids. I just thought, yeah, let's go for it. And it's been absolutely fantastic. I suppose the worst that could happen is you could come back with a really bad Italian accent. That would be the yeah. worst thing. Not yeah, quite we'll British, back. not quite Italian. That would be the worst thing. Yeah. Like you could yeah. have a really spelt, like Armani style blazer and uh, trackies. That, that would be the worst thing. That would be the worst thing. Uh, my friends and my parents would not be too impressed. <laughs> So what is it you're doing out there? What 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 is the job? Who are you working for? Because obviously it must be a big deal to basically pack your bags, leave Blighty, go out to Italy. Yeah, so I'm very privileged to work for the world's largest independent financial advisory company called the Devere Group. Um, what my job role is, is taking a lot of exams and training and also developing business for the consultant who I work for very sales orientated you'll be very good on the phone um and also you just got to know your stuff and um, the the famous sort of line that we always use is uh you know we don't want salesmen at devere we want clever people with good exams who know how to sell there's a difference um and yeah it's very early days, early starts, but it's, it's nothing that I'm not used to. I enjoy it. Very high intensity, competitive. It's good. You see, the thing which strikes me there is you look at your age, you said you're 21, and yeah. at 21, most people are still kind of like, oh, maybe I should go to university. Maybe they've done a degree or dropped out, whatever they've done. They're finding their feet. They don't really know what they want to do. Like you said before, maybe they're overthinking. Maybe they're not thinking yeah. enough. They just, they're trying to find their place in the world. And we know at the moment, prospects are shite. We know that. We know that the economy is in a bad place. We know politically it's in a bad place. We know society is um, at loggerheads. I mean, we've seen the division in Britain with Brexit. We've seen it globally with a number of issues. And at 21, to have been, uh, to have gone through university, got yourself a degree, to um have based you're a musician um you're a soon to be published author you've got your own podcast going on uh you've gone down physical endeavors through boxing you've got a list of accomplishments that people 
twice your age would struggle to get anywhere near where does that drive and that hunger and that determination come from well first things first on that my favorite quote of all time which i live my life by is from the dark knight and it's from the joker and he says i just do things okay and that goes back to the to the thinking part it's nonsense you know i've noticed that so many people after leaving uni you know, they go on this journey of discovery. I'm going to go to Thailand and discover you, to just discover myself. Shut the fuck up. No, you're not. You're going to go to Thailand. You're going to waste a bunch of money. You're going to come back unemployed and you're going to be looking for handouts. That's what's going to happen because it happens every time. And um, also, when I was young, so I was born in Adelaide, Australia. Um, and at a young age, I was diagnosed with a metabolic disorder, which means that I uh, can't eat too much protein. Um, I've actually never really spoken about it before, but I can't eat too much protein because my body can't digest it properly. Some of my enzymes are dysfunctional, which means if, if I was to eat too much protein, a toxic substance in my body would be created called tyrosemia, and that's toxic to the brain. Um, I'm one of, I think there's about seven of us in the world with this condition. Type 1 and 2 is more common than the type I have. I'm very lucky to have the type I have because if I had type 1 or 2, I'd be dead. Um, and it's just sort of very lucrative. Not many people know much about it. They don't know how my life's going to develop and what it's going to look like um, because there's no cure. So I guess as well, there's that small compartment in the back of my brain that says, just like anyone, we don't know what's ahead, so we might as well you know seize the day carpe diem um and and that that is also a driving force and as well i don't know you know part of it i don't know part of it i'm sure it's genes the, the drive and as well i just i'm acutely aware that in the world is a bunch of nobodies pretending to be somebody um and i'm just going to continue trying as a nobody until i become a somebody i guess and i think that's what we should all strive to do no, I agree with you. And if people didn't have that drive, we wouldn't have achieved anything, especially when we're faced with difficult situations like we are now, or when we had difficult situations after any major war or conflict and we have to rebuild. If people don't have that drive, if they don't just do, then it will all fall apart. What was it in particular about the things that you've done that you were drawn to, you know, your degree, um, you, you've boxed, you've entered into music? Uh, you're writing a, no, uh, a book. Um, what is it about those particular areas that have kind of appealed to you? So I've always been really passionate about poetry. Ever since a young boy, I've been writing poetry since about the age of six. Um, and, you know, I, I went to a school where, you know, if you it was an all-boys school. If you go to someone and go, oh, listen to this poem I wrote, they're going to say, you're a bit wet, mate. You know, and that was that was something that was fine. I'd just read it to my parents or, or, or my close friends, right? And then at the age of 16, I went, you know what? And this was more, I was very arrogant at the age of 16. I said, um, <laughs> I went, you know what? I'm hot shit. Someone's got to listen to my poetry. So I'm going to start rapping. I'm going to turn all these poems into music, into something that's marketable, into something that people can listen to, right? But I never, ever, ever wanted to put it on channels spotify make money from it it's never really interested me i love the crowd that's what i feed off so i started getting up on stage and doing it and that that's where that came from it's a pure passion project um with regards to boxing i love stuff where there's a massive risk reward factor so where you got to take some sort of risk and um, the, the key thing my one of my other biggest passions is surfing and that's where i discovered my sort of love for the risk you know you go out there on a red, red flag day in Cornwall, you know, where the wind's blowing and you've got 10 foot chop and there's maybe two other brave souls out there. You get out there, it could be your last laugh, but it, it really, it humbles you because you realise how futile, you know, this, this idea of everything's going to be okay is because if you make a mistake, it's on you, you know, you have to control the reality that you're creating and surfings like that. So when the opportunity came around to do the boxing, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was hammered at a party 
or was it a ball with my girlfriend at the time? She really didn't want me to do it, which made me want to do it even more. <laughs> so I just sent the email off, signed up. It wasn't a charity event, so it was just golden gloves. You just go there and you box. And I thought, well, you know, I want to raise money while I do it for the hospital that treated me as a young boy, Great Ormond Street. So that's where the sort of charity thing came out. Done a few things since then, 3,000 push-ups in March, whatever it was, uh, you know, just just do things, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so from um, from what you've just said there, you are basically like Patrick Swayze from Point Break. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, without without the criminal side, I think. <laughs> I don't know. You've got the mask. I'm sure you got the mask yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. Did you, um, did you win the boxing? Yeah. Good. That yeah. Was not the first thing. Otherwise, I would have the, had to have ended this right there. Yeah, the training was so. Bru- I also Bru- picked Bru- a, Bru- a very specific Bru- opponent. The opponent I I fought against. Uh, I don't want to had dredge no up. Arms had no arms no 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 no. he was so i weighed in at 63 at fighting weight 63 kg and we didn't actually do a weigh-in in the end so you got to sort of pick your opponents and i picked someone that weighed in at 74 kg that was much taller than me so he had 10 kg on me um but he was a bad person and he'd done some bad things and there were things that I knew about and quite a few other people knew about. And I needed to, I'm not a naturally aggressive person. I needed to have someone that I didn't like and I had specific reasons for. And man, it was it was simple. When he was doing one push-up, I was doing 10. That's what I want. I'm not a good boxer. I'm crap, right? But I won on cardio. You know, he tried to knock me out in the first round and he was nearly successful. And then my mate shouts out from the crowd, Linus, he's gassed. He was sitting on the chair in between the round. I was standing up, of course. I said, I don't, I'm not sitting down. I don't want a chair. I was just walking around the ring. Like, Psyched him out. Fucking, Psyched him out. Yeah, like, fucking pro- like, there, was, there was no chance. <laughs> he was gassed out. And by the end of the third, I was holding him up to punch him. He was done. And no one could believe that I won because it was, the weight difference was insane. But I said, you know, exactly as I said, when he was doing one push-up, I was doing 10. I used to I used to run to the run to my training after a day of uni doing law. Right. I used to run to my training in a 10 kg weighted vest. When I started the boxing, I was a fat fuck. I've been lazy. I just come out of COVID, like everyone else, right? I weighed 78 kg. And over a period of three months, I dropped down to 63. And and that was that was no easy task. Um I'm five nine, five eight. Probably five eight. I don't really know. I'm somewhere in that range. Yeah. So you're talking. I'm just trying to think. A hundred and hundred and sixty, hundred and seventy pounds there or thereabouts, and then you dropped. What was it? About fifteen kg. You said. Yeah. So from seventy eight down to seventy three. Yeah. So thirty thirty five pound weight a weight drop in how long? How long was the training? Three, three, three months. months. I mean, probably less. I mean, that is that is mind over matter right there. That is where it starts to hurt. You increase. You don't stop. Your intensity goes up. You push through that barrier. You don't, um, you don't quit. You, r- you raise your game to the next level. Yeah, because why stop, of... right? Well, absolutely. You know, why stop? My mate said, well, how are you going to win this fight? And I said, I'm going to fight on 4% body fat. That's how I'm going to win this fight, you know, and I did. See that right there, I think personifies your ethic that I get from all of this is that there's something in front of you or um, I don't want to say a challenge or, or whatever, but there's an opportunity and you're going to grab it with both hands. So if you're going to take this challenge on to fight, then you're going to go in at 110%. You're, you're not going to cut a corner. You're going to go in and if there's opportunity to do another 10 push-ups, you'll do those push-ups. You won't slack. You won't stop. You won't quit. Like you just said, in your mind, you're going to fight on 4% body fat. You're going to go three rounds, four rounds, whatever it was. uh, And you know that you're going to beat him through speed and stamina. And and that's exactly what you did. And you sounds like you've, you've had that sort of mindset 
and applied it to whatever you do, whether it's a degree, whether it's writing a book, doing a podcast, um, anything else that you're doing, it seems like you've got that kind of approach that if you're going to do something, you will do it. You won't, you will not fail. Well, but I've failed before, but by the very least, I give it a fucking 110% because otherwise why do it, right? You got, oh, there's so many losers out there, honestly, that are so clever. I'm not even clever. My, the only reason I did a law degree is because my English teacher told me I'd never be smart enough to pass a law degree. So I was like, right, I'm picking law. You know, it, it, Fuck it you, just, it, Smith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's tough. Don't get me wrong. There were times where, you know, I was in a relationship at the time I was doing boxing and she was so worried about me because the rate at which I was just dropping weight was just insane. But I always just told her, I, was, I always said, you know, it's going to be all right. I know what I'm doing, you know, you know, and, and she she only calmed down after it was over. But I, I always said, it's going to be fine. And mates around me, you know, parents, they were all really worried about it. But, you know, when I agree to do something, I've, I don't just agree to do anything. I know that I've probably got it. I won't just, I'm not an idiot. I don't just do things that I know I'm not capable of because we've all got our own capabilities, right? Mm. All these influencers on TikTok saying, you can do the impossible. It's like, yeah, it's true. You can do the impossible within your skill set, right? I can be a fucking surgeon. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> you can't. So, um, obviously, with what we spoke about at the start, you're not going to be a champion bodybuilder because you can't process yeah. the protein needed to build the muscle. So we know exactly. as long as you set the right parameter. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to be. Person, I'm not going to be a champion boxer either, right? But if within that, within that that sort of event i knew i could dominate so yeah. if there's one person who um deserves a postcard from being in italy working at the de Vere, it's that mr smith that teacher who said linus you'll never pass a law degree well here i am now motherfucker nah you, you know what he was a good teacher i think uh you know i think i always appreciate the people that tell me no because then I can come back to them in however long times, you know. You know what, you know what he'll do? He'll say, it was all a part of my plan. Part the so plan, just, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. to say you can't do it because I knew that you would. Yeah. I mean, when I graduated, it was weird because I I also study a lot different to everyone else. Like, I'm not smart, as I said. Like, everyone would do their reading. You know, what you get, you get a set of reading at the start. And obviously then you'd have exams that were based on maybe 2% of that reading, right? You'd have a, an essay to write. And I was doing all these things, as you know, I was performing on stage twice a week. I was doing the boxing and all this. There's no way that I could have done it like they wanted me to do it. I wouldn't do all the reading. I'd just do the reading that surrounded the essay. So I had time to do all these other things, right? So, yeah, I can't remember what the original question was, but yeah. Your, your teacher, Mr. Smith, uh that's what we'll call him we'll take credit for um saying you couldn't do something so that you would do it and then you were saying that you're not a learner who just consumes reading material you won't sit there and read book after book after book you've got your own specific way of how you absorb or manage all the things you do but can then still pass an exam or excel in all those different areas yeah i, I, I got away with it I put it, I put it like that. You know, it's there are so many people that I, you know did it much better than myself. But I got away with that. I had to get away with it because I can never just do one thing. It's just so frustrating. <laughs> you know, I have to be like here, there. You know, doing this, doing that. I don't know why. It's just in my head. I just can't do it. I have to be doing everything. And the only way I could do that successfully was by having a very, very structured, concise method of completing things. Organization, basically. So you almost like compartmentalized everything. So you had all these different things that were going on. You know, we, we touched on the fact you were boxing. You've just touched on the fact that you were, you were performing music. You had your degree to study to. Um, you decided you were going to raise money for charity. Each of those have got their own 
sort of commitments they're all fighting for your time they're all fighting for the resource which is your mind your body whatever and so you needed to, to plan almost like your week or your hours a bit here a bit there what takes priority focus mm. or the rest of it and that was something you were able to do yourself yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm lucky because i there's only two things that i know i have okay one's confidence which is so important if you don't have confidence, you need to get it. It's going to be crucial for the world we're about to be living in as well. Um, the second thing is I'm a well-oiled machine. And I cannot stress that enough. You know, I don't focus on the whole outlook. Oh, I'm going to be here in 10 years time. Forget it. You don't know where you're going to be in five minutes time. Don't bother. Okay. Don't worry about the week worry about the day and within the day worry about the next five minutes if you could do that you'll be easily organized because it stops procrastination you know there's that brilliant picture of you know the two statues um where it's actually only one in the picture there's just the thinker who's sitting there thinking and then there's footsteps because the do is gone of course he's gone what do you think he's doing? While you sat there and planned your business idea, I gave it a go. <laughs> right? That's really interesting. That is really interesting. You see, it's... And there's there's a lot of... Some, some of the things you do are related. Some of the things you do are not related. You were talking about your poetry before and how you got into performing music by effectively getting on stage, reading your poetry. Funnily enough, there's a number of people who've done that in the past, like uh, uh, Anthony Kiedis from Red Hot Chili Peppers did the same thing. He was a he was a lyricist, got on stage, read his poetry, and then you've decided to go away from those kind of, uh, I guess you call it, melodic way of delivering lyrics, and you went into rapping. How did that come about? Yeah, so I thought it was very funny. So I, I was privately educated, right? I got, a, I, my parents could never afford to send me to private school, but lucky enough, I got a music scholarship. So I was able to go. And um, and that was all thanks to my mum, actually, because she pushed, pushed me from a young age into music. I, I don't give her enough credit. Um, and yeah, when I got there, you know, when I got to that stage where I started rapping, I thought it was absolutely comedic that you could have a white privileged boy from a nice family, okay, getting up in a private school and doing something so fucking gangster. I mean, how awesome is that? It's just it's just a running joke. That was my USP. Because as well, every time someone I, I go, oh yeah, I rap, someone go, <laughs> and then they actually hear and they're like, oh. And I it's that moment I look for, that moment in the face where sometimes the face drops you know, or, or something happens. And it's always brilliant when you go to somewhere that hasn't been exposed to it before. Like when I was, I was at uni, I've been there for all of three days, right? And I signed up for the open mic and there was this guy on here on before me, bless his cotton socks. He's there with a guitar, you know, singing something lovely. And then I got Oh, take on. himself really seriously. Like, like- Yeah, I yeah, got on and yeah, I had yeah. a three piece suit on with shades and my hair slicked back took off the suit and of course i was just wearing the third piece nothing underneath and i was just like is everyone fucking ready to go and everyone just couldn't fucking believe what they were seeing and that's that shock value it's that drop in a face especially with some of the songs that i used to perform i used to have this song i don't perform it anymore um but uh it was called freedom speech and there were just some lines in it that you know anyone at my uni who's seen it would pick up those lines and they'd say you know that that's the line and it inspires conversation after as well because some people hated that song because it was the truth and you know how much people hate the truth nowadays and um, yeah. yeah yeah but yeah no it's just it's that moment that i look for the shock you know see that's got of, um <clears throat> tiktok written all over it right there somebody needs to sorry. find those those bootleg videos and they need to make their way onto tiktok that's what they need to do <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> But it's, it's funny what you say, because it's the challenging of conceptions when people's face drop, when they realize that this is for real. And not only is it for real, but it's 
it's right. Whatever it is it's trying to get across, like you just said, the truth, uh, it's that realisation of whatever they thought. Um, it's You had a preconception, and that preconception is obliterated, and then the message behind that as well is powerful, and then it's kind of like that whole sort of thing. And as the person who's responsible for that, it that must give you a lot of um, reward that your your message, your performance is making people think or question what they thought they knew or that first impression which turned out to be wrong. You know, yeah, you're... absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's so amazing because, I mean, I always say that the job of the poet, the job of the artist or the rapper, it doesn't matter what art you're doing, right, is you don't have a solution. That's the people is think you're meant to have a solution. You know, I'm not meant to have a solution to what's going on in the world. What's wrong with the world? My job is to rip off the fucking band aid and expose the wound so everyone can have a look. Then you talk about it. Mm -hmm. All right. And it, you know, that shock value, a great example of it would be I had this song called Private School Trash. Okay. I went to the University of Exeter, which was heavily private school. Right. And the idea of private school trash was that it was about the fact that you can go to private school and there were people there like me whose parents barely made it to get me there. Right. And then there were the rich sods that didn't put effort in. They didn't try. They just expected daddy will do this. Daddy will do that. Right. And I always ha I had this song, you know, and, um, you know, I'm just piece of private school trash. Daddy's going to solve everything with a bit of cash, you know, like all this stuff. And I got off the stage. And this posh little prick comes up to me and he goes, Oh, hey, that song's so offensive. I can't believe you did that. Like you're probably <laughs> some you're probably some you don't know anything about private school, you're probably just some state school wanker. And I it was such a moment I smiled at him like I've never smiled at anyone before. My two mates were behind me, I always had a little mini entourage. And um I said to him, Everything I said in there was factual and you're the piece of private school trash. Oh, and just by the way, I I'm not from a state school. Bo bis bit, bimis bitis bang. I speak Latin, motherfucker. I'm from a private school. Man, get the fuck out of my way. <laughs> well, that, and his face was just like, and his friends were all laughing at him. I was just like, oh, mate, you're not going to live that one down. <laughs> I have that's, to say, that's... <clears throat> kudos on your, uh, on your Prince William impression there. That was really good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, mm. that's um, that takes some balls, you know, to go into that environment where basically everyone in front of you is a toff, everyone, and uh, well, they weren't all toffs, but yeah, a lot of them were, yeah, yeah, and you're basically not lauding, but you're kind of you you're showing their white privilege in front of them. That's what you're doing. You're showing their kind of get off your ass pull your finger out type mentality sort of yeah of and them. you know what you know what a lot of them the the way to tell if they were actually private school trash is if they didn't get the joke <laughs> if you can't laugh at yourself a bit and there were plenty of my two mates that were flipping behind me were both private school and they thought it was brilliant loads of the private school kids they loved it because they could relate to it because they knew people that we exactly like that. But if you weren't loving it, and if you weren't getting it, well, <laughs> we've we've uh, we've discovered the elephants in the room, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's them. Yeah. Are you exactly. still Are you still performing now? So, yeah, I've got some plans. So, obviously, I've been forced by many of my friends and and some people close to me to finally get down and record a few things so i haven't i've got gonna have an album coming out uh, next year called graduated um the first tracks are recorded right ready to go is called graduated and um, I, I can tell you some of the lyrics if you like you know i finally graduated i outdid the prediction i left uni with a bag of broken hearts and a nicotine addiction <laughs> i finally graduated i'm that bit less shambolic i left uni shredded out of wood and now i'm a tired alcoholic it's just something that everyone can sort of relate to and so I've got that song coming out, which is going to be good. Going to do a big marketing campaign stuff. I love that sort of stuff, you know, so that's going to come out. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully we'll be 
performing. So I'm going to be in between Milan and Reading uh, next year. Um, and I'm hopefully going to be getting back in the ring in Reading and also performing. Looking to do biggest venue I've ever done before. Um, trying to you know, try and get on stage in front of 800. So What's see how that goes. Uh, don't know yet, but it'll be wherever the boxing is. So the way I do it is I'll do the boxing and I'll perform to open the show like I did last time. Um, so hopefully... Someone like the Hexagon big... or someone like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, because we get um, listeners and viewers from all around the world, um, Reading is basically a, a large town, sort of 20 minutes outside of London, um, very, very close to where the royal family live in uh, in windsor windsor castle um so for linus to be there if anyone wants to come down and support him uh yeah it's it's a hop skip and a jump away from london sort of slap bang in the middle of south england really so anyone who's kind of oxford southwest london anything like that it's really easy to get to um having seen snippets from um from previous uh it does look like a hell of a show so i'd definitely 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 um uh, recommend people to come down and see and uh once i know dates i'll come down as well and i'll record it definitely 100 percent. We'll i can't guarantee up there. you i can't guarantee you'll like it ladies and gentlemen but you will be entertained <laughs> and at the end just like gladiator are you not entertained yeah of that's course the, that's the thing man that's the thing course, that's, that's yeah. brilliant because all work and no play makes people you know boring as fuck you know you've got yeah. to have an outlet you can't just be education and work you've got to have something which like stokes the fires or inspires you or or gets you excited you know whether it's performing whether it's charitable work family something you can't otherwise that well just runs dry so it's good that you've got that that outlet you know the music and yeah. boxing and everything it keeps you it keeps you sane up here oh 100% because like, I want to be in front of people. I'm a big people person. I need to be talking to people. I need to be building relationships with people. And the idea that you can stand on stage or be in a ring and you can have, you know, hundreds of people invested in you without sometimes without even knowing you. That means totally. doing something special. You know? Is that why you've got into the podcasting world or and, and the social stuff? Because you can build that relationship with people. You can put content out there. People can get it, give you comments. The podcasting world's a bit different. So I'm actually not a natural interviewer. Much better at getting interviewed. I find it very difficult sometimes to ask the right questions and draw out the right topics. But I'm getting better. It comes out practice. I'll just keep going until, until it's right. But um, yeah, the podcast... The podcast is is what I like to say would be my little society cure project because it tries to address the issue of confidence in young men and young women. Mm. Um, and believe me, I think it's a massive issue. I agree. And it relates we, we were talking before coming on, um, on air about um, positive messages positive reinforcement talking about healthy mind healthy body that people almost need i don't know if it's reassurance but they need like a positive message from people who have been there and done something in some sort of physical capacity and then you can take those messages make them visual and you can deliver mm. them to people so that they can get something from that yeah it's trying so i interview I've interviewed some amazing people. I've interviewed a girl called Harriet Barnsley, right? And you should listen to this, all right? If you're sitting there um, whining and complaining like some pathetic loser, you should really listen to this, right? She got hit by a car at 101 miles per hour, killed her friend, nearly killed her. She woke up from a coma four months later and was told she'd never walk again and that she'd need round the clock care. She's now a novelist and she's on her feet. All right. So if you think that you've got hard luck in life, shut the fuck up. That's, Honestly, I don't care. That's amazing. I was absolutely, I'd hear it was because I'm naturally an arrogant person. I love being in the gym and just, you know, looking great. Like these are all the things that I love. Right. And 
it made me think so hard because the day after I went to the gym and there was this disabled person in a wheelchair doing like pulls right on the cable machine. Mm. And I just looked at that and I just, I, I almost, had, I'm not a very like, emotionally sound person, but I almost shed a tear because honestly, just thought about myself and I've been looking in the mirror before. I just thought, like, it's your, so lucky, mate. Stop being such a wanker. Humbling. And it's really it? humbling. Yeah. And it's not just the podcast, not just helping others, right? It's helping me as well. It's helping me become a better version of myself because mm. you can always become a better version of yourself, right? Totally. So, yeah. It's, you've got to have humility that you, um, you're never the finished article. There's always something that you can improve on, um, a new avenue you can go down. Um, learning knowledge, learning skills, um, learning how to deal with your emotions, learning how to deal with setbacks. Um, and when you see people who are either born or suffer horrific you know, circumstances and they come out the other side with a strength and a resilience and an attitude, it really does... Um, kind of kicks you in the balls and basically says shut the fuck up you know if they can do it then whatever first world problems you think you've got yeah they mean, they mean fuck all really yeah and it goes back it goes straight back to this sort of victim culture that is just pushing itself into our society it's just that everyone's got to be victim everyone's got to be silent. it's like you're not i'm sorry you're just not right you know and people always think that stuff's just going to land on their lap. In in the most competitive era that we've seen, where people like myself who are working their arse off probably ain't going to own a house until they're 30 years old, if that, right? And you're sitting there and you think it's going to land on your lap. It, it goes back, and this is the brilliant thing that stuff like boxing and all these things have done in my life, right? I, the first day of boxing, I couldn't skip. And I looked like a fucking jerk because everyone was there like skipping up and hated it so i couldn't skip i was really embarrassed so i went home and i skipped for five hours straight just getting water until dark right and every time i couldn't i, I did it without my top on in the freezing cold right and did it for five hours until i couldn't do it anymore went to bed and every time i would mess up i'd whip myself on the back with a skipping rope just lightly right just to say you know wake up keep going and i kept doing this every morning two hours a day and my neighbor who had dropped off exercise right never spoken to the guy one day i'm walking out of the house going to a uni at 7 a.m or whatever to get to a lecture and he goes you know what i watch you skipping out there every day and I hadn't been doing exercise for ages and I started going on runs just because I saw you skip it. And it's like those little things are amazing, right? They're amazing. And it's, you know, I didn't wait for something to land in my lap. I didn't wait for someone to just go, oh, who's how you skip? I just gave it a go. You're not just going to get things given to you on a silver planet. You've got to accept that. And people don't. Yeah, yeah just wait, 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 wait for things to drop, drop in their lap. And it's, it's just, it's just frustrating, frustrating. you know? Because there, there, there are so many people out there that are better than me, you know? There are so many people out there that have so much talent and so much skill, but rather they're just worrying, they're being anxious, and they're just letting it all go by the wayside. It's such a fucking waste, honestly. You've got um, a similar outlook to me. You're a, you're a few years younger than I am, but when I was going through school and college and uni and all the rest of it, Everyone was saying that my sort of generation, which was, you know, uh, you had the, the noughties and the teens or whatever the, the decades are called. We had more opportunity than any other generation had ever had. Obviously, technology, 24-7 sort of society. Everything was available at our fingertips. Um, more people than ever before could go to uni, more job prospects, blah, 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 blah. And they were saying that we had it much easier than anyone else. We didn't have wars to kind of clear up after. Um, this was pre-credit crunch. There was no major recession to recover from. And they they felt that we were fucking lazy because we weren't grabbing life by the horns, for want of a better term. And then you fast forward a little bit 
and people call them the snowflake generation the those who feel like they're entitled they don't have that work ethic or whatever is that is that kind of the perception that you'd say is is accurate where do you think that comes from how do you kind of because you're in that that generation how do you kind of see it how would you describe it what are your frustrations where do you think all this is coming from and uh, you know what i think i think it's a lot worse than that i'm gonna be honest so well i've been here in milan i've tried to start a new venture <laughs> which is oh, i wanted to get into modeling because i did a bit of it at uni for various t-shirt companies and like a couple of surfing brands and things like that and i wanted to get into it just so I could say I did a model shoot in Manhattan High, um, which is like the fashion capital. Just because, just because I want everything, I'm, I'm not going to stop, right? And um, so um, that is one for the fucking obituary right yeah. there. Fucking yeah, dancer, fucking author, fucking imagine uh, fashion model. Oh man, right. imagine I, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm still trying. So I got one like shoot trial the other day, right? For an underwear, like nice. brand, a shitty underwear brand. Was it? Was yeah, it sort it. of like Borat style mankini? Is that what? It was like it was like some like for blush or like it was, like, it was called like some stupid it. Italian name, right? And I go there and like all the models there were like they were all like English speaking, right? Hmm. And I immediately noticed the problem. Okay, which okay, firstly I was the smallest in the room, which is understandable. I'm not a tall person, and it's the thing that's been stumping me the most in this pursuit um but i immediately no noticed the problem and everyone's gonna hate me for this and you can hate me i don't give a shit i was the only one that had the closest resemblance to a six-pack and it really fucking confused me in fact there was even a chubby bloke there and look fat shame and all this we can get into that but it just confused me a bit so we did the model shoot Okay, a couple of them did look like they had some experience, right? Um, but they, I, they I had thought, the pose, the whole, you know, the yeah, way yeah, they yeah. They had, they had good. I get really nervous in front of the camera. I don't let it show because I do a podcast on confidence. Imagine if I was nervous. So I was just like manufacture a bit of confidence, right? So do the shoot. I thought it went really well. And they gave it to the fucking chubby bloke. And I just couldn't believe it, right? I work out every day, seven days a week. I do a 45 minute workout. Okay. I eat, I'm a keto, right? 90% of the time. I don't eat any carbs pretty much. So I can stay so lean. And this guy that had sat around eating bread his whole life on a fucking sofa got this modeling contract. Did now, he was a little. It said that you're modeling for some bacon. You needed somebody who was going to eat the bacon. That's what it was. Yeah, it was just like, it was one of those things, man. And on, I said something awful on the way out. I was like, well, what's next? Are you going to start hiring mathematicians that are shit at math? Okay. Like, I, sh I shouldn't have said that, right? But it just, it just frustrated me so much. And it goes back to what you're saying. With like, it's not just the youth, okay? It's everyone. It's the people that run that are running everything. It's the people that are setting our social standards. They're doing it so wrong. When did we start getting prizes for showing up? I'm sorry. When did that start happening? You know. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, this is why I started focusing more on the individual level. You know, I left that shoot, didn't get the job, lost out on 800 euro. Fine, whatever, no problem. But at least I can go home and I'm still fit. All right. At least I can go home and I can still, you know, I'm, I'm flipping smoke, I'm a flipping drinker, right? But I still run every day because, like, they're their vices, right? But at least I, I still push on, right? So I could go home knowing that I'm still fit, all right? And that's why I've been focusing more on the individual level because society is setting a standard that's wrong. So I'm going to set my own standards. I'm going to set my own standards. And sometimes they're so high that I don't achieve them. I'm not perfect. Okay, but I keep my baseline here, which is what society is not doing. And my baseline is I eat three meals a day, I drink two liters of water a day, and I exercise every day. Every day. Because that means that this can all happen, things out of my control, 
but the stuff within my control will stay there. Like, like a religion. It's fucking frustrating because I was in um, my late 20s and I, um, I had my first child, which is brilliant. You know, great age because you're not too old that you're detached. You're not too young that you lose your freedom and, and whatever it is you want to do. And you're not so old that as they get older, you can't be fun or the mm. rest of it. And, good, good age. Yeah. And what scared the fuck out of me, if I'm being honest, was they went to like day nursery, whatever you want to call it, age of two. And already, like even I remember when I was a kid, you always had like chubby kids and smelly kids and all the rest of it. But teachers would always say, well, you know, you, you got to be got to be careful. Watch what you eat, exercise a bit more, maybe take a bath. Um, like you just said, there was a certain set of standards. And now it's like you can't say anything which might be seen as constructive, constructive criticism. You can't say anything which might hurt someone's feelings. It's like it doesn't matter what you are, how you are, why you are. That's okay. It's like we have to celebrate whatever. Even if like 50% of society are doing things to themselves that will put them in an early grave. Obesity, yeah. smoking, eating, excess eat, drinking. Eating, eating their grave with their teeth. Literally. <laughs> literally. Yeah. Like every spoonful of fucking caramelized sugar is an extra day off your life. Like, fuck it. Yeah, go for it. Brilliant. Let's here's a medal for it. I can't get my head around that. It I'm not saying you need to put a gun against someone's head and say lose lose weight now but yeah. i mean seriously what the fuck like why is it okay for people to be walking around clinically obese and be it's not okay for it? it's, it's not, not okay i just, I just want to give a disclaimer that there have been points in my life where i've been chubby mm. and overweight i'm just going to say that but it was never a permanent situation i was a chubby little kid but i had a, a condition yep. that men couldn't eat certain things and especially at a young age I, I also, I also want to put it out there, just, just like what you were saying, there's also circumstance where that will happen. Because like you were saying, yeah. there's stuff out here beyond your control. Whether it's hormonal, whether it's to do with glands, whether it's something hereditary. Obviously, we all went through lockdowns, but there's mental health, there's diabetes, there's, there's, there's a range of like emotive, psychological, physical things that can result in you know your weight doing that they can go up down and being obviously sort of anorexic and that kind of thing is equally dangerous but yeah what we're is. talking about is the medium what is within your control and what can you do within look, there's always going to be a tolerance like you'll never be perfect but you can control what you do what do you, you can in? control you... too you can control how much exercise you do and what you eat Correct. If you're overweight, more importantly, unfit, right? Because look at Tyson Fury, just you know, the Chisora versus Fury match. Yep. You know, Tyson Fury is a is a chubby blue. Yep. But he's fit. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. Right? You 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 can't have it both ways though. So people always have a go at me for fat shaming. And they're always the people that lie in, eat bread all day, and do fuck all. Tyson okay? Fury is a bit of a bad example for a couple of reasons because the way that he fuels himself is done specifically he he's he he'll take on protein he'll take on carbs he'll take yeah. on slow burning things and he'll take on an excess because he has to fuel himself he's yeah he's, what is he six eight six nine he weighs 19 20 stone he is gonna have a lot there and it's designed to slow burn so he can go 12 rounds or run 15k or and also he's only training certain muscle groups he's not a bodybuilder He's not a PT, um, so he could do do that. Yeah. But the, but but the thing which you hit the nail on the head is like you don't have to be a professional athlete to take a vested interest in your life, your health, your well being because here is related to here a hundred percent. But also on a wider scale, let's say you are depressed or let's say you don't have that get up and go like we spoke a little bit about some of that drive that you've got and you're blessed that you've got that but let's say not everyone's got that some people have been to school of hard knocks not so easy yeah. to get that drop fine but why is society saying it's okay and applauding and celebrating and rewarding people who are fucking lazy or 
want to be obese or want to be addicted to substances or don't give a fuck and that's that's on the increase so you know bad substances lack of exercise obesity um the 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 sort of the, the sedentary lifestyle is going like this and the people who are actually doing output and looking after themselves it's going like that but it the 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 support and the <clears throat> I guess you'd say the reward and the celebration is in the wrong trajectory. It's for the people oh, who yeah. are doing fuck all. And it's the people yeah. who are doing that, who have always looked after themselves and will live longer, who are now being shamed or being um, singled out for want of a better term, like yeah. you were talking about a minute ago. It's It's gone reverse. And now we're wondering why for the first time, I don't know what it's like in Italy, but there was some data released in the UK uh, a couple of weeks ago, for the first time, I would, I want to say in about forty years, it might be longer. <clears throat> life expectancy is dropping, so it's been going up a little bit, like let's say five months or six months or a year, every single year for four or five decades. So you, mm. you know, average life expectancy was seventy, seventy-two, seventy-six, whatever it might be. Now it's dropping because of obesity and because of conditions that people get and because people don't exercise and all the rest of it. And also the mental side, because it's linked. Yeah. But those mm. people are being rewarded and celebrated. Oh, yeah. I don't get it. I, yeah. I don't get it either. I'm not going to live my life like that. I will not bend the knee. I've, I've, I've been, I've been cancelled before at uni, which is a funny story, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm just going to say what I mean. You know, I, I don't even think it's about living longer, to be honest. I don't necessarily want to live long, you know. I want to live to a decent age, but it's not, it's not why I do it. You know, to, to be quite honest, I do it because I want to be better than everyone else. <laughs> like, and I mean that in I mean that in every sense of the word. But I think that now the idea of what is good is changing so much that I've had to readjust that, and I've just got to just got to do it. I've just got to push on because I know it's right. I know in my heart, you know. And I'm not saying I don't have fun. Well, I was training boxing. There were people that gave up alcohol. People who stopped smoking. I have this saying, which is. You can party with the boys as long as you wake up with the men, okay? And I would be out till one, maybe two in the morning at a nightclub on a Friday night. I'd get absolutely hammered. I'd still be up at 7 a.m. skipping outside because that is that is the negotiation I've had with myself. Linus, you cannot let, let yourself down. You cannot let standards slip because how can I stand here, sit here, and talk about all these things I got in. I got in at three thirty a.m. last night. Okay, I've already done a forty-five minute workout, and I'm going to go for a run after this. Okay, I can't sit here and preach this if I'm not doing it myself. Okay, and it predicts success in the workplace, everywhere. The more physically fit you are, the more routine you are, the more disciplined you are, the better you will do. It's a god-given, god-proven rule. It's also one more. Oh, it's, sorry. No, you know, it's also because I've experienced this myself that there used to be certainly when I was growing up, um, nineties and noughties, even the even the eighties, there were certain illnesses that you associated with times of your life. Look, you're always going to get horrific things. Children will get like leukemia, and uh, and that that's horrible. But it it used to be that things like respiratory illness or heart disease or Parkinson's or arthritis used to sort of affect people of a certain age, 40, 50, 60 plus. And what we're seeing through lifestyle, like who you were talking about, people who don't have drive, people who let themselves go, they are having these kind of illnesses, debilitating disease, much younger. So in your 20s, you've got people who are having chronic heart problems and diabetes and all, all the things that you would have or normally associate with people twice their age, and it's happening now. That has a knock-on effect to things like Parkinson's and, and, and that kind of thing. And it means that when you get to middle age, you don't even have to be 70, but when you get to middle age, you're physically incapable because you lived your life so fucking terribly when you were younger. Yeah. 
I don't want to say you're done for, but it becomes such a struggle. I've seen friends or friends of friends or their older brothers and sisters, you know, suffer from horrible diseases that they shouldn't have been contracting. But when they've been drinking to excess or eating terribly or just not looking after themselves, lack of exercise or whatever. And because all through their life, they were basically supported and celebrated for those choices. Um, it's led to, I mean, it's debil debilitating. It's horrible. I don't know where that mm. comes from. I don't know where all of a sudden <clears throat> it became a okay not to try. Like I remember at school, you know, you can fail, but you fucking try. And if you fail at one thing, try something else. Try something else. else. Now it's like, oh fuck it. The state will sort you out, or you don't. You don't need to try. I don't understand where this lethargy's come from. Well, this is the scariest thing about it, Adam. So. I'm very lucky I've moved into a workplace mm. which is leaderboard orientated. They don't care. Gay, black, white, woman, man, it's where you are on the fucking leaderboard. All right? And the problem is, especially in universities and schools, if people are having this attitude, all right, and then they get into a workplace like the one I'm in, firstly, they've got to know no matter what society, oh, well done for trying idea is, you're competing against people like me, and there are plenty of us, right? And they're going to put 110% in and completely destroy you, right? And the second thing to know is, you know, and since I've been, I've been at my office for what, two months? I've seen five people come and go, fired, hired and fired, really? right? Yeah, because in my environment, there's none of this bullshit. So, you get, people out there have got to be very careful to understand that just because they think it's the societal norm, there are still places out there where that, that shit does not fly. And I still believe, and I hold this opinion, I hope to God it's true, but I really believe in it, that people who have a good work ethic, who don't listen to these nonsense, no matter how much society, because of online platforms and all this bullshit, changes over the next 20 years, they'll still be at the top. They'll still be at the top. I still believe that because I just I just do. I still think it's a numbers game. It used to be that you'd go to school or whatever and it would prepare you for the real world. So you've just described going into a workplace which is very competitive. Sometimes mm. it's dog eat dog, but it always results in some form of some form of leadership. Ultimately, you need somebody who's going to supervise or run the show or whatever. It doesn't matter what you do. And it seems like people are not being educated or prepared for that world. And they're being celebrated the further that they fail in that world. So if you don't try or, you know, you want to be what people used to call a loser or, you know, whatever, through choice or, uh, I guess, laziness, um, you're, you're setting yourself up to fail even further in later life. Because when you go into the world of work, or benefits, or whatever it is, you haven't got that that ethic. You don't have that hunger. You don't have the ability to pick yourself up. You are going to be told no. You are going to fail. And they're going to turn around and say, oh, what's that? You're middle-class white guy. Well, that's that's not good enough. Whereas all your life you've been told that's good enough, and now it's not good enough. That's not right. You You can't recover from that. I don't. I, I just don't understand where. I mean, like I say, you've probably you've probably lived through a little bit. I don't understand where it's come from in this generation, and I don't understand why suddenly teachers or anyone else around parents suddenly think it's okay to be shit. Like you, if you're naturally not good at something, okay, but at least try, and then try something else. It's the lack of try and the giving up, not bothering, which which infuriates me. Yeah, you, you always wanted something you're good at eventually, right? Because I was shit at school for probably a good half of it, you know, and probably wasn't trying hard enough, being a bit lazy. I wanted to be the class clown. I always loved making people laugh and having a good time. And then one day I just woke up and went, oh, okay, so things are getting a bit real now. Let's kick it in gear. And then I've not stopped since then for one second. I've probably not, not, not worked 
in a day, or you know, even Christmas Eve, you know, like I'm there, you know, I'm on it. Um, and I think, I think I'm lucky that I've run into a couple of things which I think I'm quite competent in, mm. but not perfect. No, and I, I get that, right? No one has to be perfect, but you just have to try. And it goes back to the whole exercise thing as well with, with everything when you live in a competitive environment or in your workplace. It's not just exercise, it's having a routine and sticking to it. Every sort of month, I renegotiate myself. I have a negotiation with myself, and I'm, I'm a tough negotiator, right? I might stand in, in, in the mirror, and, you know, I might be like, so I'll talk a bit about what I do, my exercise routines. When I get in from work, I'll have, I'll have a chest or a back day. So chest day, 50 push-ups uh, wide, 50 stomach crunches, 50 push-ups in, 50 stomach crunches, shoulders, um, more abs, um, uh, Russian deadlifts, whatever, and then, you know, cardio for another 15 minutes, right? At the end of the month, I might stand in front of the mirror and go, right, Linus, okay, we've done this this month. Let's push it to 60 something like that have a, have another negotiate negotiation with yourself and agree on the terms but the point is as long as i'm doing that every day these other things like competitive environment the doggy dog world these are, it, they don't they start to matter less because you've got that constantly in your life i had a very tough time about three months ago four months ago i had a very tough time with it you know something hadn't gone my way okay i just come out of an absolute high on life, one boxing, done all these things, right? And everything was going well. I was the definition of a fucking winner. And I lost an aspect of my life, which was annoying. And it was out of my control as well, something I couldn't control. The next day, I was so sad, but I was still exercising. All right. And I still had things to do. And I still had podcast stuff to do. So when you fill your time, as much as possible, these things stop to matter. You can deal with the little tragedies quicker. And it's the exact same thing in the office. If you make sure that your baseline's there, so you've agreed you're going to do this much work today, you're going to get this, this, and this done, and you're ticking off that checklist, everything else doesn't matter because it will all fall into place. It's a, it's a mind um, over matter thing, isn't it? So, you know, you can come out of a relationship or you can have a bad time of it, like you were saying. Yeah. And you can either choose to wallow in self-pity because, you know, it can affect you physically, mentally and emotionally and all the rest of it. Or you can, like you just said, <clears throat> you make that agreement with yourself and you get out of bed and you fucking do that exercise. The intensity probably won't be there, obviously, but you yeah. do it. You do it. You fill your time with those other commitments so that you can't dwell on it and you're forcing yourself not to be sort of down here, basically. Um, but what it seems like is some people genuinely either don't have those skills or didn't learn those skills um, or can't be asked to, for want of a better term. I think it's the third, man. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I think it's can't be asked. Mm, you're probably right. But they get rewarded for that. They get told, oh, it's okay. You don't have to. Rather than, well, fucking do it. Because in the real world, when you know you're trying to earn a crust, something doesn't go your way. Unfortunately, your boss and employer isn't going to let you sleep in indefinitely. They need you to get out of bed and work. So you have to get that. I guess I don't want to call it resilience, but fucking grow a pair for want of a better term. And sometimes yeah. you just have to do it. Whereas we're in this situation at the moment where people are applauded for not doing it you touched on something earlier where you said you'd been cancelled before so there's this cancel culture which is going around which is you can't say or do something which might be considered even one percent slightly not perfect and super supportive and whatever um because now you're not inclusive and now you're not like blah 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 when actually part of that whole saying something which can sometimes be tough love or whatever is the real world what were you counselled for out of yeah. interest? What what was it you said or did that people took offence to? So it was another of my ventures. I got bored of just uh, performing rap 
once every two weeks. So I decided, you know what? We're going to do a rap set and a comedy set in the same night. Um, and uh, the comedy set actually was really important moment for me because it was really nerve wracking actually. When I get up to rap, it's, it's it's no problem for me. It's it's easy. I don't get nervous at all. But for some reason, with the comedy set, I I realised that sort of not like music. You know, comedy is extremely personal, and each person likes different things. So it's really hard to communicate to a crowd. But you know, I did it fine. It went okay. I probably wouldn't do it again, but it was alright. I told one joke, um, and the centre of the joke it was a pun, so it was a play on words, and the centre of the joke was about non-binary people right it was a very simple joke okay it was the whole story started it was all based in a nightclub so it was about a night i had in club i right and the story at the very beginning i said ladies and gentlemen by the end of this story you're going to find out how i injured my cock in club i that's <laughs> that was it and the story would just involve various jokes in in, in between um, how, how and did one... you into uh injure your cock in club i out of interest are you at the end? <laughs> um, and there was so I, the way I injured my cock was going to be in the bathroom. So I had to get myself in this imaginary story into the bathroom. It was sort of based on actually a true story. So I'm dancing with all these girls, right? And I say to the ladies to the left of me, "Ladies, I've got to go to the bathroom. Sorry, I've got to go." Um, they they all they all looked very upset, right? At this point, then I said, "Ladies to the right of me, I'm sorry, I've got to go." These ladies didn't react the same as the other ladies. They looked really offended. And I said, why are you offended? And it turned out they were non-binary. When push came to shove, they were very upset with me. That was it. It was just a play on words. They were very upset with me because it's like the right way of, ter- of terming them, right? That's quite good. And you never guess, right? So you never guess who complained about this joke. The binary people. <laughs> yep. Straight, white, female. And I'd run it through a focus group, okay, which included members of the LGBTQ community. And they were fine with it. And I was told to a place that I've been performing at every two weeks for a year. I was told that I was never allowed back again unless I stood up at the beginning of my next set and did a 10-minute long fucking apology. And I told them to fuck off. And this was a pub, right? It's a very small pub, so maximum capacity, like, 40 people. Two weeks later, I was on stage in front of about 120, so I told the public, yeah, you know. What like, do they say, though? What What do they complain about? What was the problem? That it was very offensive, and that... Um, the straight white females were saying it's offensive. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were very upset, and they were complaining to the pub owners, saying they weren't going to come again because of me, because of that one joke. And they actually Why, cited... though? I don't understand. Uh, because they're whiners and complainers, and they're probably losers sitting around doing nothing right now, I could imagine. But at the end of the day, so the, the joke ended, the whole, like set was basically I injured my cock because I zipped my cock into into my trousers when I was doing a wee. But, uh, just, just, so you, just, just so you listen to me. And that's actually a true story. Um, <laughs> oh, God. It's basically right, something right. about Mary. <laughs> but it was funny because oh, they, all forgot, they all forgot that that punchline was coming. So, and then I, I acted out and I went, I, Ah, like that, and it was very funny. It actually worked quite well. But yeah, this girl complained, and they and they sent me this massive like. Email, Might be because like, you got your cock out to reenact it. That's my book. No, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> but I will add on that. Actually, this is where society's got it all wrong. I did impersonate an Indian person. I impersonated a Chinese person. I did accents. Anything that you know, it probably was a bit on edge. But the one thing that you're going to complain about is a bit on fucking words, really. So, yeah, with regards to that, nowadays, the way I think about it is you, you, you can't cancel me because I'll just go elsewhere. And that's exactly what I did. I went elsewhere. Um, I'm not famous, so good luck trying to cancel me. You can't. I'm still going to be doing what I'm doing. So, fuck off. It's just <laughs> madness, opinion. isn't it? It's madness. Mad- that... no. and, that, and that this is the problem I was saying about not preparing people for the real world. So, you're going to hear stuff, voices all around you. There'll be supportive people and they're going to be people who put you down. And there's going to be things you like and things you don't like. And 
now, if you hear or see something you don't like, rather than have to deal with that shit, because unfortunately, life is hard, you can turn that fucking thing off and have it never come back. That's madness. That's like, I mean, not that I'm a, a, a massive fan or agree with him or whatever, but we had this thing with um, Piers Morgan, remember, with the Meghan Markle thing, where he went yeah. live on TV and he said, I think she's lying. And then rather than everyone go, well, that's his opinion, he gets onto a live on-air argument about something that no one on that show really has any interest in. It doesn't affect them whether she's telling the truth or not. And then his bosses basically said, like with you, you either apologize or you're sacked. That's basically what yeah. it came down to. Because he's aired an opinion. He made it clear that was his opinion. He didn't say it was ITV saying she's a liar. He said, I don't believe her. My opinion is she's lying. Since, and, and now you're not allowed to have an opinion. You can't. I don't know if he's lying either, but I, I think good on him, mate. You know, it, but, it doesn't matter, does it? Because no. um, it, if you express an opinion, doesn't matter if you're a watch listener, whatever. If that opinion doesn't match your own, so what? You, you know, you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to go out for a pint with Piers Morgan. You know, if you go on stage and tell a joke about they, I, it, whatever, you don't have to go and ask for your number afterwards. You can just go, eh. You don't have to then go and and complain because you've made a funny joke. You haven't said there's anything wrong with being non-binary. No. You just made a funny <laughs> joke because they didn't like it. Yeah, my my girlfriend at the time was actually uh, bisexual as well, so um, which was very very odd. Like I'm I'm suddenly some sort of homophobe. It's like fuck off. But you didn't and say they, anything like, contrary. Uh, yeah. And they, they, the pub said, uh, oh, do you, do you want me to give you the number of the girl that complained so you can call her and apologise? And I went, uh, well, unless she wants to meet up with me and allow me to call her a cunt to her face, <laughs> I don't really want the number. <laughs> you know, quite... But this is the other thing, right? If you made a racist joke, right, then I could completely under... Or a sexist stroke or any form of discrimination... Yeah. Fair enough. That that that's where you draw a line. You know, if you use a racial stereotype or whatever it might be, not not cool. But if you're just making an observation, because one of the pronouns they like to be called is they. Yeah, I'll I, use I, the correct. <laughs> and you've used the correct pronoun yeah, as well. Oh, too, right? You know, they were very upset with me. <laughs> It's just ridiculous. Look, it all relates back to everything we've been talking about, you know, with the world. It's just it's in absolute tatters. And I'm going to stand up and say, fuck no. Because I know a lot of people that are fed up with this nonsense. Okay, you can call me... I got called, what was it, toxically masculine the other day. Because we were in a nightclub, and in Milan, it's very loose. You can smoke in a nightclub. Sometimes people got their top off. I had my top off, right? And this girl just calls me toxically masculine. And I just think, yeah, okay. If, if, it means, if it means to be fit, to be healthy, to never to stop, to, you know, not listen to other people's whining and whinge problems and not whining and whinge myself, then fine, I'm toxically masculine. But, you know, that's the way. It's, it's a predictor of the way... That I run my life, I believe, because I've it's not because I've come up with this amazing idea, it's because I've looked at what other successful people have done, okay, and they've got one thing in common, they all keep fit and healthy, they don't whine and complain, they don't set into this sort of loser attitude that society is currently promoting, and they keep pushing on. And that's what I'll do. I don't care about cancellation, I don't care about any of this rubbish. It's all rubbish and it's gonna go. <laughs> have you seen the film fight club yeah so you know tyler durden and he's talking about yeah. masculinity and he's talking about how we're trying to be watered down and you know it's it's wrong and men are punished for acting like men you know primordial yes. men or primitive men or masculinity is now frowned upon and it's like that's been taken up and run with to the nth degree any sign of masculinity and that doesn't mean by the way you have to be a chauvinist or discriminate no. or you know prohibit against women it's any sign of um t 
testosterone basically um mm. and and it's like you're you're punished now and it's yeah i i i don't know where it goes because you know i see in primary schools uh as young as 8 you've got people now being spoken about with sexual sexuality you've got people who are spoken about in terms of size you know and it's encouraged for them to be how they are and there's nothing wrong with anyone by the way but if you're gonna uh if you see that a child is say obese or isn't trying or is lazy or whatever they are encouraging that behavior to continue and all it does is it results in lethargy when they get older you know i go back to when we had say world war ii and we were coming out of that or any other major conflict that we were involved in if the youth of that time had been like it is today this country would have never been rebuilt because no one would have ever done anything you know men women and to a certain extent children who undertook things you know it would just nothing would have ever got done and i'm I, i fear that we're heading into like a procrastination period because you know it, it's it's fine for everyone to be fat lazy or don't try and in fact they're encouraged to do that and anyone who tries to be assertive or proactive or l- take a leadership role is reprimanded and shamed or cancelled for you know speaking up on their opinion i i don't know where it goes you can't have yeah. a voice or anything and on, on the point you were saying about about women as well i'm actually really passionate about so you know women in business and things like that my podcast team is actually i always do 50 50 split in every project that i do so it's always 50 percent women um it you know especially with the interview process and things like that i like to have equality of opportunity and um, is a big thing for me and with with the women i work with they want strong men around them funnily enough and they're all successful it's funny Very. you say that, because that's what Jordan <laughs> Peterson says. He talks about equal opportunity, not yeah. equal output. So I says, totally agree. He says the best person for a role or a position or whatever it is you need, that's who you bring in. They could be black, white, old, young, man, woman, don't identify, doesn't give a fuck. It's If I yeah. need somebody to fill a position to give me an output, then I bring in the best person to give me that output. End of story. Yep, and it's this is the way you should build a team, and it's the way you know it's the way same people who run successful businesses will continue to build a team. Quite frankly, um, you know, a couple of a couple of my friends, bless them, they wanted to come on and be part of the team, do various roles because I don't pay any of my staff for the podcast, but they get paid um, with opportunity. So I've connected them with future employers mm. and things like that. And they've, they've got a lot out of it, actually. That's how I got my first job. When I was at uni, I worked for a merchant bank for a while in Dallas, Texas, over Zoom during COVID. Um, and it was all from the podcast episode I met, who's still my, probably going to be my lifelong mentor. Uh, his, his name Damon. He's in the first episode of the Soul of Tale podcast, actually. And he, he got, me, got me this role. And was working with him for a while and you know it, the predictor of all of this is just grasping the opportunity pushing hard and society can go whichever way it wants i'm going to continue doing that and there are women around me and men around me and they are go-getters and the, some of them are doing sensationally amazing things and they will continue to do so because they're exactly like that how do we step out of this on a greater scale then how do we this cancel culture and this celebration of lethargy or can't be bothered or whatever we want to call it. Um, how do we, how do we snap out? Unfortunately, we don't. Okay. So what's going to happen and you're already seeing it happen. It seems you're going to get a lot more divided and a lot worse for a lot of people. Um, and there's going to be a massive shift in the opposite direction. And we're going to go back to the dark ages of we're going to lose equality for men and women. It's already happening with the trans argument, you know? And women and women are already losing some of their freedoms, like going to the fucking bathroom. Man, come on. I always seen it happening with Andrew Tate, right? You must know Andrew Tate. I mean, 
Right. right. So, so I don't agree with pretty much all the things he says, says apart from the obvious discipline, discipline strength, strength and all this. this is, and, and he talks about biology. He has, he's got his MMA background. He knows how to keep fit. He knows how to have mental yeah. discipline yeah. and learn. He's, and kind of, he's, he's got, got a deal, right? right? Because anyone that stands on the internet and says, look, the, the, the basic, basic reality is not, not everyone wants to, not all men want to dye their hair blue and dress like, like women. women. Some just want to be men. men. It's like, of course, right? But he's an extreme shift to the right, okay? And he is going to do a lot of damage. And I've done a four-part series. I know we haven't gone to the, you know, talk about that yet, but I've done a four-part series on him, right? And the point I make is, unfortunately, loads of people that are listening to him are young men who don't have six-packs or aren't disciplined. They're just taking the bad things that he says about women and they're applying it in their lives. And this is happening, right? That's... That's one, one of the things that's happening. Okay, so we're getting streams, and everything's going to go wrong. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to see more Andrew Tates come out of the woodwork. So people are fucking fed up, and that's bad. It's bad for everyone. It's bad for business. Okay, so that's there's not there's not a solution. There's not a way out. It's going to rub a band, and it's going to flick the fucking snowflakes right in the fucking face. And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to be sympathetic. I'm going to sit there and go. Told you so. Is that because people are like disillusioned with how everything is at the moment, and that's why we're yeah. in this clip? They're, They're living in a fucking, fucking fantasy. fantasy. People walk. Oh, I, I, I can just stand in front of. I used to do it, and I stood in front of crowds, and I just look and I scan the environment, and there are some people that are on fucking autopilot. They're walking around, going, "Oh yeah, it's really good that everyone could just be." themselves and everyone could be fat and everyone could be yeah, is it we'll, we'll see we'll see i'll tell you what if putin fucking invades england you won't be saying that you know when when things get serious the weak ones they always you can pick them out like that when an actual situation comes around which is deadly you know and you see on a small scale you can you can pick them out very quickly. No, I, agree. Um, I don't want. To, I, I don't want to end on a negative. I want to end on a positive. What's um? What have we got in terms of timescales for your book and uh, your music in terms of release, publication, syndication? So, so the, the book, book is either going to be late next, next year or early the year after. after. Um, the the, the, the sort, sort of wrapping and, and all that, that that's, that's going to be ongoing starting from January. January so it's going to be stuff coming out. Um. Uh, I've already got a song out, by the way. <laughs> if I was going to do any promotion, it's called Mr. Raver. So, funny story about that. It's actually really inspirational for anyone that, you know, listen to my Joker quote, Just Do Things, right? My mate, he's an absolutely fantastic DJ. He's released, he's performed in some big venues, right? He comes around one day and says, Oh, look, I made this sort of techno beat. And I was wondering if you could put some lyrics over it. I went, yeah, all right, I'll write something for it. I love to write, so I was like, yeah, brilliant. So I wrote something for it, I performed it in front of him. And he went, you know what, man, that's great. Um, let's let's record this some stage. And I've heard that a lot from people I've worked with and it never really happened, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 whenever. The next day, he brought a whole studio around to my house and he was setting it up. And it was just the joy of my face was like, yeah, this is someone that, you know, they bring receipts, they do what they say and we recorded it and then we put it out and it's been absolutely brilliant we got more than 2,000 streams on Spotify which is more than I thought we'd ever get so yeah it's fantastic so yeah so the first thing that's gonna drop next year is graduated my song graduated I'm really looking forward to that coming out and got the second season of the podcast we recorded 10 episodes, so they're going to be coming out starting 16th of December. The Solvator podcast, you can find us on Instagram, it's probably the best best place to look. So that's really looking forward to that, it's really exciting episodes, a lot of inspirational women this season as well. Big, big theme of physical fitness as well, also in there. Um, and yeah, the book, that's the last thing. Um, so the book I'm writing is called The Richest Poverty. Um, and I started writing it when I was 18 years old, um, and I've rewritten it probably twice now, because when 
like, like the, the age 18, 18 you think i think in my mind i thought i was an adult clearly wasn't because i read back when i wrote like, jesus so i i've, I've rewritten it um and it's about um it's got a lot of themes of men men's, men's mental health in it yeah it's got a lot of themes of council culture in it as well um and a lot about family uh, it's about a actor um, who was raised in a really harsh environment in the UK. Um, and he, his dad wanted him to be a thespian, like a proper Shakespearean actor. He doesn't have a good relationship. And on the stage. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. He doesn't have a good relationship with his dad. His dad was an English teacher. Um, and he ends up becoming a blockbuster junkie actor, right? In loads of B-grade films in Hollywood. And, and he, he hates, hates himself, himself. He, he hates his life, he's got serious mental health problems, he doesn't believe in therapy, but the whole book's narrated, narrated through his psychiatrist, who's a woman. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, he, the book basically is about him reconnecting with his father, because he gets the role of Hamlet, okay, in, in, in a stage production in, in, Hollywood, in Hollywood area, so he becomes Hamlet. And it's, it's about, about him reconnecting, reconnecting with his father through that that, um, that role, um, and and it's really interesting because they say there's a lot of references in there to the way our society is going, and yeah, I think it's going to be good. It's it's something for me as well. It's 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 my book. I don't care what anyone else thinks about it. It's been an absolute journey writing it, um, and I've learned a lot about myself, taught myself some new skills. Um, and yeah, yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to people reading it because I think it will resonate with a lot of men and women out there. Where did you get the inspiration for the story from? Oh, so yeah, yeah the, the way, way I'm, the way I get inspired is really weird. So I don't know, like when I was, I don't look at things like my creative side of my brain doesn't look at things like other people look at them. So one of my first rap songs I ever wrote was called McDonald's Muncher, and it was all about a fat bloke I saw him in McDonald's and he just looked really depressed and I went back and I just wrote this whole story of this fat bloke but it was interrhymed with the whole McDonald's menu so <laughs> that's that's like I just something will hit me in the face and the richest poverty was just I don't know it was just this idea that you look at people on the internet and the way they're living their lives and you think wow this person's amazing they're so happy this at this but really we're only seeing that 10 percent, and it's all about you know virgil stokes who's the main character of the book he's got all these riches um and he's got a career that most people would love but he's poor deep down inside you know because he's not doing what he wants to do um and it's really a story of, you know about about the broken poet really you know the, the starving artist who wants more so yeah that's sort of where the inspiration came from what i'll do is i'll include all the social handles in the description when this goes out um once we've got some dates either venue for the boxing or um release dates for the music or more information on the book we will definitely be getting you back on definitely to give us Brilliant. a update on those thanks, thanks. Well, well it's been, been absolutely, absolutely i know you great. have to run so we have to let you go i yeah. appreciate you taking the time to speak to us about everything um we're in very uncertain times so when you're back on we'll definitely touch base recap on some of those um but i want to know more about the book and the music and the boxing so when we've got a bit more meat on the bones or dates ready to go come back on and we'll definitely share that with everyone yeah, yeah hopefully be some charity events coming up soon as well so we'll, we'll do do, do another, another another charity something something rather than try running this time i think because running i'm terrible at. <laughs> I'm slowly, slowly getting, getting better. better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that goes. Thank, thank you very much for your time, time Adam. It's, it's been an excellent coming on. Well. Take it easy. Brilliant. Thanks. Ciao. And for everyone else, we will catch you again soon on another episode. Thanks for tuning in.